Um, so next company is Halston with you now. So four minutes starting now. Yeah. 3.30. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Halston Prox. I am the co-founder and CEO of Heal Now, uh, an ERA-backed company, actually. So, uh, Heal Now is the ordering and payments platform for pharmacies. We reduce the amount of phone calls and faxes that they receive by allowing their patients to pay co payments online, schedule their delivery, and answer any questions that the pharmacy may have in a frictionless way. So that means that we don't have a mobile app for you to download. We don't require you to sign up for a portal. Uh, we utilize a text message and a work and an email workflow where it'll say your doctor will send a prescription to a pharmacy. If that pharmacy is using our technology, you'll receive a text message saying, Hi Owen, uh, Dr. Kaufman has just sent you a prescription to Curex and Pharmacy. Click this link or call this number to complete your order. Then we walk you through a set of questions and ask you, what are your allergies? What are your medications? Uh, and we, we actually allow you to uh, sign for your prescription as well online. So we like to say that we've turned a three-day game of phone tag into a 30-second ordering and payments process for these pharmacies. So raise your hand if you've actually heard of the uh, acquisition of Amazon and PillPack. Exactly. So um, there are thousands of pharmacies who right now who are looking for technology to leverage uh, the existing customers that they have. That's why we're here. So we started to focus on pharmacies that require uh, you to submit your like, co-payments all over the phone. So they have a call center staff uh, dedicated to getting you to pay for that prescription. Well, through our process and through our platform, we've seen that our pharmacies are able to uh, increase their revenue, uh, better interact with their customers, and have faster payments. And overall, the patient experience is just much better, honestly. And so, so today, we are doing oh, hundreds of orders per day on our platform. We have several uh, customers on our platform. Uh, we think that by the end of the year, we'll be uh, at ARR of 250 uh, k and so that's what we're looking for. Uh, we, on top of that, we're specifically focused on hospital pharmacies, specialty pharmacies, and mail order pharmacies. Uh, some of our pharmacies in our pipeline today are NYU, uh, UPMC, and Pittsburgh, and we're actually, actually talking to Kroger's as well, uh, along with a few specialty pharmacies. So my background has been in Epic. Uh, healthcare IT for about eight years. I implemented Epic Electronic Medical Records for large healthcare organizations like Mount Sinai, Duke, Stanford's of the world. Uh, my co-founder Josh, she's right in the corner, uh, uh, is an experienced software engineer who's worked for startups and enterprise uh, companies as well. So that's what we do. Really deep machine learning on, 
on sort of the information and making it so easy to use and so unbelievably customer friendly and that the, the interface um, and anything that actually has a customer touch point is so incredibly well done that you turn those customers into this incredibly loyal, rapid group for you. Yeah. And that seems to me as like one of the top priorities that I've been thinking about. Agreed. And so that's what we're actually yeah. doing. Um, I think what's good about the industry that we're in is that every pharmacy has the same problem. Right. Uh, so it could be small or very large, they all have the same problem. So now that we're out in the market, uh, we're starting to uh, get momentum on the pharmacies that are doing uh, roughly $100 million uh, in revenue, yeah. which is kind of you know, small for the industry. Um, they are, we're pushing out new features every week, and this is only going to help when we uh, close a UPMC, for example. Right. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So our next company is Misa Katri Miller with Zinsure. Is that what you say? Great. Hello, I'm Isaac Afimula. I am the founder and CEO of Zinsha, and we're a finance and lending fintech startup based here in New York. We provide loans and installment payments for patients, and we provide insights and fraud prevention and prediction for insurers. So we help patients bridge the gap between their cash flow and the coverage from their insurance company. We enable them to navigate an extremely complex and storied and layered landscape that spans from the insurers to the providers to their own internal banking mechanisms. And we let them do this across not just their own medical costs, but all of those of their family and linked to family provide, uh, insurance programs. We help insurers avoid fraud. They're able to reduce dupli uh, duplicated claims. They're able to see the, and track cost and spend of patient from time of service right the way through when the out-of-pocket transaction is executed by the patient. We help the providers by giving them real-time insights into their revenue. Right now, providers have to sort of have a bill, send, and pray mentality where they can execute a bill and then wait, and they don't know when their, their patient is going to pay them. So we set out a, little, a year and a half ago uh, to work on what was meant to be a modernization of billing software and inadvertently built a real-time inbound revenue platform for providers and realized that actually instead of turning out yet another product and app to the market, we could just give our app interface to the consumer for free and instead kick the stool out from under the predatory lenders in the space. This allows us to give both the patients, the insurers, and the providers the infrastructure that they need. In the past 20 plus years, all of the innovation in the space has come largely in the intermediary stages, the revenue and practice management systems. And going bottom up, trying to link across the 300 revenue and practice management systems was our original go to market plan. Thanks to Murat and a rather robust DRA interview process this spring, we were able to pivot. So, uh, $3 trillion is spent annually on medical services in the U.S. And of that, $260 billion is in out-of-pocket spend that consumers then have to bridge themselves. But right now, consumers are left with unpredictable medical billing and very few structured options for how to handle that. So a typical scenario will be go to hospital, receive... Okay, so we'll go with... Our beachhead market is New York State, uh, the metropolitan area, which is $2 billion annually in out-of-pocket spend for what we call pre-pregnancy, maternity, and pediatric. And the reason we chose this as our beachhead market is because New York has one of the largest medical markets in the country, but it's also one of the best examples for how people who don't anticipate being at risk of medical debt end up there. I think I'm wrapping it up now, so I will open up for questions. Thank you. So I think that you should try to get rid of those things. Because what you're, you are super structured, but I think that if you had done that without those notes, it would have been much more effective. Because it would have been in your own words, not looking at them. And what is important to you, I think you know what the important points are, all points on those notes are your point, right? And so 
What you really want to do is you want to make sure that the couple of big points come out. Like here in that, this is an awesome area, right? It's painful for everybody. It's completely inefficient in terms of the US sort of healthcare system. It's really difficult to sort of like bridge and deal with sort of all of these pieces, right? So you are starting at a great spot, right? But I think just telling it in a way that actually it is in your own words will be much more effective. Okay, so that's on the fourth side. Great. So now, um, given sort of that, so one thing that I would really sort of push on is like, and I know this wouldn't be necessarily something you would sort of do in a pitch, but certainly with, with investors, I'm interested in like cost of capital. Like, how are you getting this capital to put, you're a lender, and there are many, many lenders in the world Right? From on deck all the way down to sort of like, you know, small, you know, sort of like under the radar lenders. And a very, very difficult area. Because, yeah, so go ahead. Part of what makes us different is that we're only dealing with healthcare finance and lending. Mm -hmm. And we're going in from top down with the insurance. Mm -hmm. So going to an insurer and saying, hi, we're going to give a consumer facing app that lets them navigate this horrific space because you have neither the time, interest, nor resources to build it out for them we can. And we're going to have all of this lending capital on the side so that we can help them bridge this space where they end up having to max out their credit cards, take out a second mortgage, turn to payday lenders. I mean, medical bankruptcy is the medical I got debt it. is I the yeah. So when we're but talking about if, if I can't um, is this literally against the insurance repayment yeah. or is there some possibility that actually the insurance repayment never happens? Well, no, so the, the, way the, the way the stack works is any, any provider in an insurance you know, system gets a little QR code. And the patient goes in and scans in and says, I have paid my $50 copay. And we track that through the QR code, through just the financial layer of the transaction, up through the RMS, PMS platforms. And we can see in real time through the API integration with the insurer themselves, as soon as the scrubbed bill is cleared through whatever level of coverage there is, what the remainder out of pocket payment is. We're using machine learning on the provider insights piece to predict who's going to pay when, but also to pre-authorize installment plans. So we're able to say, your providers are really given two options right now. They can upcharge the insurer in anticipation of non or late payment, which is increasing costs across the board, or they kick a bill over to collection oftentimes prematurely because they're getting twitchy and they sell their service for cents on the dollar and that impacts the consumer credit which impacts future ability to... Is the payment guaranteed or not? No. Okay. So if the payment were guaranteed by the insurance company, I think you would be in a much better spot. And so if you think about any number of... There, there are a couple of companies that have popped up that are parallel to this, which is that the next generation of payday lending there is a good new wave of payday lending yeah. where it goes through the employer and if before I get paid my, you know, whatever it may be every two weeks or every month, um, my payroll company knows what I'm going to get paid, right? They know what I can pay back. And there are lenders now that actually integrate with the employer, are very white hat, very reasonable in terms of, you know, sort of what they charge, and the payment is guaranteed. And in doing that, you're able to both attract a lot of capital at a low cost of capital and then put the money to work. So if I were you, I would start looking at areas where the payment is absolutely guaranteed by the insurer. You can verify it, you can advance the money, and then you actually don't get repaid by the, sort of the, the patient, you get repaid by the insurance company. And it's absolutely guaranteed. And that seems to make a lot of sense. Great, thanks. Next, we have uh, Aprova Udeshi Zeto. There you go, you have four minutes. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Aprova Udeshi. Uh, I'm the founder of Zeto, and I'm actually from Sri Lanka. Uh, so I'll come to that later. Uh, so Zepto is the simplest uh, BI and analytical tool. Uh, it's an AI-powered analytical tool for everyone. Our goal is actually 
to democratize the usage of data. So I'm going to make two very bold statements, right? Um, so data-driven insights are far better than opinion, right? Um, and machines are far better than humans. So why is it that you know everyone's talking data, everyone's talking analytics? Why is it that we've still not been able to solve the problem? Uh, and and that's the real problem that we're trying to solve, right? So I see three real problems out here. Firstly. The existing problems, uh, the existing solutions that are out there are actually not made for non-technical users. So they're made for very technical users. So whether you've got the Power BI's, uh, the Watsons, etc., they're made for very technical users. So if you have to ask a sales or a marketing manager to actually use the platform, you find it very difficult. So that's a UI, UX problem, and we're trying to attack it uh, through a design-centric problem, a solution, rather. The second problem is that Decision making uh, using data is actually restricted to hippos, uh, highest paid person's opinion. So it's typically the CEO who kind of makes these decisions. We want to democratize that process. We want multiple people, sales managers, and everyone in the organization actually using the data to make these decisions. The third, deployment and actually getting it started is a very painful affair. So what we built uh, in our platform is the simplest and the most easiest to use platform in terms of BI. So within four clicks, the user is able to create a dashboard. Now, this is actually built completely for non-technical users, as I've said. On the AI piece, humans have this whole thing of being able to make, they believe that experience is decision making. And that's the reason why humans you know, keep making decisions. But with computers or machines or with artificial intelligence, you take out this whole piece of decision making and you let the computer to make far better decisions for you. So there's no cognitive bias and that's why we brought in the AI piece. So on our AI platform currently, um, you're able, the user is actually able to see insights on his data. So within one click, the user is able to see the kind of trends, the anomalies, the correlations, and he's actually able to train the data uh, to actually make it better. So for example, pop-ups come in, say, was this user, was this insight helpful or not? And really where we want to go down is the predictive analytics part of it, where we're actually helping users say, hey, did you know that your sales in New York was up 20%? Uh, and you know, we want to kind of build on that path. So we've got some very decent traction over the last couple of months. Uh, we've got the largest uh, brokerage houses in Sri Lanka, we've got KPMG on board as our customer, we've got the second largest bank in India as our customer, uh, and we want to build this business. A bit of background to myself, I'm a computer science graduate from Imperial College in London. At 23, I built up the bond trading business for Port of Mandra Bank. So, I was through that entire thing. So, I was waiting to hear what the particular problem or use case that you are actually going to go after. And the reason why I say that is you need to get started somewhere. <laughs> and at the last second, you were like, oh, I mean, or like, but even that is too general. And I can give you sort of a macro sort of thought or two on you, when you have a general technology that can do anything, it can't do everything, though. And you need, as a founder, to choose a place to get started. And that place has to be big enough, but not, it doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be a place where you have very particular use case, and you know who to sell to, you know the data set you're dealing with, you know how to access the data, you know what other programs you have to integrate with, you know what department to go to to sell to and talk about this problem, and then, that problem needs to be apparent across many, many different sort of similar, every bank has this problem with this person in this particular way and the same set of data in the same sort of way. Uh, so sorry, is it industry specific or no, is it? It's much more than industry specific. It's industry specific and problem specific to get started. Okay. And so if I were you, the thing I would really focus on is what is that initial use case that is repeatable 20 times, 30 times across many, many different, you know, sort of like similar businesses, that's where you can get started. 
a general idea, a general platform that does general AI or BI things is not useful to necessarily anyone. Because you don't know who to go to. You don't know who to sell to. Not customized. Okay, uh, so just to kind of answer that question, um, in terms of uh, the market itself, at least in the Asia Pacific region, uh, which is where we've been selling, uh, we find that even a basic thing like a dashboard or insightful MIS, forget the AI piece of it, is something that people are not using. They're still using Excel, they're still using you know, uh, charts, they're still using basic uh, Excel charts to actually get their data. So we believe that we are able to solve this problem from an insightful MIS perspective uh, without even the AIPs coming into place. So our goal is to kind of have, I mean, we've already built the NLP platform where users just type in what they want, like sales in New York for the last two months, and they're able to get out the insight within two seconds. Got it. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Companies. We have one more company, but for that, who here would like to come up here and pitch to Owen like on the spot? It's going to be random. Okay, so raise your hand. Okay, this side needs more hands. I know there. Are, who who is who are people here with startups? Who are entrepreneurs here? Raise your hand. Who is a startup? What? I didn't ask you, or if it's a cryptocurrency startup. Uh, what are the other people doing here? Okay. Who are the people without startups? What do you do? Uh, I'm a software engineer at Dropbox. Uh, cool. I'm looking to start a startup though, or get involved with one, so I think it's good for a technical part for finding out. Okay, that's actually good. You that's going to be everybody. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right here, it's the right place. You just are the most popular guy. I like that, like, it's both that guy. What do you do? Uh, invested in PC and also uh, I'm an investor in a bunch of other startups so I'm interested in Okay, here. awesome. We have investors. Are there people who are not startups or investors? Uh, I come from Palestine and I work for the presidential office on uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'm interested in the way uh, the judges or evaluate what is possible. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Who else? I'm just curious, like, yeah. I'm the founder and CEO of Grain Inc. So a company called Grain Royalty. And we sell apparel and brand goods. Awesome. Consulting we'll company. Yep. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, we do outsource CFO, accounting, tax, value. <coughs> Great. I mean, you are in the right place, but you know, don't pitch too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So we'll do one more company and then develop the pitch in your heads, and then uh, Owen will ask some filtering questions to pick the company who's going to come up here and pitch. So our last company is Yaniv Miron with Fedor 7. is a cybersecurity company. What we do is we significantly reduce the amount of time it takes to detect uh, internal threats from an average of months to an average of hours. Uh, that comes with the significant cost reduction as well. What's uh, special about Fenwar 7 is that we basically developed a whole new approach to detecting internal threats. Other solutions typically uh, are based or rely on uh, things like user behavior, or uh, trying to keep up with the latest zero days of the week. The problem with that is that even you know if you look at the latest zero days that come out all the time, um, at the end of the day, they, most of the time they rely on uh, a set of basic concepts that have been used in the past, reused over and over again. Um, so what we did was instead of trying to focus on the infinite new vulnerabilities and new zero days that are constantly coming out, what we did was modeled out and focused on uh, a finite set of attack concepts, which as an attacker are very difficult uh, to avoid. Um, and that's basically what we look for. We analyze network traffic and look for those uh, attack concepts. For example, if you look at the way an attack is typically built, uh, once you have an initial breach into the organization, attackers will always try to spread out. 
Um, and throughout that process, what they'll try to do is a lot of times what we call network scanning. Now, there's a million different ways to do network scanning. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but at the end of the day, from a network traffic point of view, they all look the same. So if you're able to characterize what network scanning looks like and search for that, you'd be able to identify it no matter what type of tool the attacker was try actually trying to use. Um, I'll try to keep it short. So the last thing that I'd like for you guys to keep in mind here is that there are numerous, or countless, sorry, uh, new types of vulnerabilities coming out every year. On the other hand, there are only uh, a handful of new attack concepts. Uh, and we capitalize on that, basically. So, just to sort of like sum it up succinctly, what particular sort of way in which you are unique compared to everybody else that's doing network scanning? So, if you look at what other companies are doing, they're typically uh, doing either a combination of artificial intelligence and user behavior benchmarking and stuff like that, or signature-based solutions. Okay. Neither of them work. Signature-based solutions, we know that they don't work because antiviruses don't work. That's how antiviruses work, obviously. Uh, user behavior and stuff like that is flawed because it typically requires a lot of benchmarking. And if you start to scan your system uh, with, for instance, a threat that's already in your network, then that will become part of the benchmark. That's one reason why benchmarking doesn't work. There are other reasons as well. Um, and what we do is basically we try to figure out a way to just avoid all that. And instead of trying to keep up with the latest threats, which what, which is what all these other companies are doing. Uh, we're basically looking for the uh, lowest common denominators of an attack. Uh, and we were able to, so. <clears throat> for instance, um, internal reconnaissance is an attack concept that as an attacker, I've been an penetration tester for 15 years. Uh, as an attacker, once you get through that initial breach, you're going to need to understand what your environment looks like. Uh, and again, if you um, look at all that, uh, at, at, sorry, at internal reconnaissance from a network point of view, then it looks the same. Scanning uh, other devices in your area will look the same no matter what type of tool you use. So other companies are trying to detect the tool that you use. Um, we look for the actual network, tra network traffic. Okay. I don't want to hear more about that. I mean, we don't have time for that, but like, I think for you to have a succinct answer to that question, where it is literally like to the point, and be like, this is exactly what we do, and here's why it's better, and by this much, we are this much more effective than other people. We need to have that conversation. Very important, sort of, for you to have sort of very distilled this answer. I agree. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so please, if you would like to come here and teach to all of you, stand up. If you're standing, please sit down. No, no, I mean, if you're standing and if you're not going to pitch, sit down or lean. Okay, please stand up if you want to pitch. But there's, there's no stand-ups here. There's nobody here. Very good, very good. Okay. Some more? Okay. How about that side? Very good. Okay. Oh, now you'll say something like, if you are this, then sit down. So I'll do the first one. If you are a cryptocurrency startup, sit down. <laughs> oh, you. 